Hey guys, this is Healthy Life Designing. I'm your host, Darian Rolls, and today we're talking sports performance. So if you have an athlete, you really want to watch this show today because we have a former athlete from Denison. He played football there. He was the wide receiver. His name is Hunter Winans. He is the manager and head trainer for TAD Sports in Granville, Ohio. And when we come back, he will be joining us to share how your athlete can get better with their sports performance. Hi, I'm Amanda Wattenberg, Regional Director at Ohio Guidestone. Do you or does someone you know have a substance abuse disorder? Have you been thinking about getting help but don't know where to start? It takes a lot of courage to ask for help, but it's the most important step you can take. If you think you know everything that's available in Fairfield County, think again. Like other chronic diseases, addiction can be managed successfully. Treatment enables people to counteract addiction's powerful, disruptive effects on the brain's behavior and regain control of their lives. Even if it takes multiple attempts, treatment does work and people do recover from addiction every day. So keep trying because your life matters. You matter and we're here to help. Call 211 and ask for the treatment resources available right here in Fairfield County. This message is brought to you by the Fairfield County Adam H. Board. Hey guys, we're back. This is Healthy Life Designing and our guest today, Hunter Winans is here and he is going to share with us sports performance and something about the fitness assessments and walk us through his training and what he does with his athletes. But first, thank you so much for being here today. No, thank you, Darren. I actually took a minute to try to get us scheduled. We were back and forth for a couple months, actually, but Oh glad my to be gosh. Here. Yeah, and so I've, I've visited um, this, the facility. It's 5,000 square foot. It's pretty big. Yeah. About, yeah, yeah, and it's in Granville, which you know, I don't even know if I shared this with you, but it's Granville is one of my favorite places. Oh, yeah. I love making the drive there, and there's so much character in that little tiny city and you love the city so much you grew up there actually i stayed there you so stayed yeah there. because i'm from Den southern california That's went to denison right. and then stayed there for an extra three years now and still going on okay yeah because you played football for denison yep and mm -hmm. was that the, all four years yeah all four years um yeah football wide receiver at denison and then athletic training major and then immediately got my job at tad and kind of been comfortable there ever since. Can you walk us through, so say I have, I've mm -hmm. got four boys that you know, and say I bring one of them in and he wants to, you know, get better at his sport. What are the steps? What are, what's the first part that you would the walk The very first through? thing we always do is our, our assessment and we have a very standard template that we do with that. So the first thing, and the assessments are always with me and we do have multiple trainers, but I run every single assessment again, keep it more standardized. The first thing we'll do is we go through their vertical jump, and then with that, I can dive into a couple more detail depending on the athlete, but to keep it baseline, we'll just get a normal vertical jump on a jump mat. And it's all electric, so there's really not gonna be any air in that. Okay. The next thing we have is a broad jump, so the first thing was vertical displacement, the next one's gonna be horizontal displacement, and there is gonna be a difference between those two, they're not linear correlation or anything, so it's important we get both. Um, then we'll get the broad jump. We have a mat that is that has the lines that are just standardized out there. So again, there's not going to be any air. We can't change it. After that, we go into an acceleration test, and then we use an electronic system when we do that to begin to take out any human error. So I'm not going to have a stopwatch and be pressing early if I like you or anything like that. So there's not going to be any air in that electric um, timing system that we have. And depending on the sport, I'll either do a 20-yard dash. For example, like a softball player or a soccer player, I'm going to do that. And that'll get their acceleration. The, and then if they're a the football player, we'll get like the, the very famous 40-yard dash. Mm -hmm. Because within the 40 yards, you can tell someone's first part of their acceleration and the last part, you get their top end speed. Like going back to the first thing, like if I have a soccer player, we're going to start out with a standard 20-yard dash. And with that, they'll get their times, and with our electric system, I can break it up into the first 10 and the last 10 of the 20, and then kind of see where they have a weakness, if there is a weakness So, in there. So explain mm -hmm. more about what this this electric system is, so people can have like a, a, can envision this a little bit better. Okay, so yeah, so it's an electric timing system, exactly like if you were to see the NFL Combine. Um, ours isn't the exact same system, but the same 
type of system where there's little cones that send out little infrared beams and then our athletes are going to be wearing chips in the dead center of their waist um, because we don't want to see any leaning or anything like that. That's so is it like a belt? Standardized. It's just a little chip. It'll just clip on like straight on their belt or straight on their uh, waistband. Okay. Actually. And the second that chip crosses the infrared line, it gets the time. So there's not going to be any air, like I said. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do a push button start. So the athletes will be on either all four or all three stance, which is whatever they're more comfortable with. The second their thumb leaves the button, the time starts. So again, it's not going to be any human error at all. And like I said, the second the chip crosses the infrared line, that gets their time. And it gets sent right to my phone instantly. I can just I can record it and show the athlete what they got. Okay, so those are the three steps, or, the, or is that all four? That was that's how the system works. And then the first part, when I'm doing the acceleration, is going to be a 20 yard dash. And then the second part, because there's two components in speed. It's acceleration and top end speed. And then so we're done with the acceleration. Now if I do the 20 yard dash, the next thing I'm going to do is try to find their top end speed. Because kind of like the vertical jump and the broad jump, there's not really a linear correlation. So I need to see which one they're weaker at because that's the one I'm going to target in programming. And with the vertical jump, mm -hmm. you know, how is that measured? Like what is the device that's used for that? We use a jump mat is what it's called. So it's going to be a pretty decent sized black mat and it's hooked up to just a little console that'll read their, it'll read their uh, vertical jump instantly. They'll jump as high as they can, they land on the mat, and it'll give me it'll give How me high they jump? Yeah. Wow, hmm. that is awesome. Yeah, pretty cool little tools that we have. And then you also use an assault bike. Yes, so that would be a little bit later on in the assessment. And the way I order the assessments is always off of their energy systems. So if you, the easy way to think about it is what's going to get you more tired, we're saving that for last because we don't want anything to affect the next test. All right, so the first part we do with the jumps, you're not going to be very tired. Next thing we do with the sprints, slightly more tired, but really not that tired. After that, we'll go into the strength stuff, which is more where I categorize the assault bike. And when they're on the assault bike, um, it'll get their max power. So I'll put them on that assault bike. I'll say, you just go to sprint as fast as you possibly can on that bike. And in one of the little corner boxes, it's going to read their, their wattage output, their watts. And I'll record that number, and that quite literally tells me how powerful an athlete is. So by you recording the number, you have, do you, ha you have an app that's, that's connected? That's actually straight on the bike. Okay. Yeah, so it's like right on a screen, like on, um, and it's like a treadmill will have a screen, and mm -hmm. the, these assault bikes have the screens, rowing machines have the screens. It's actually right on the screen in the bottom corner. So that one, I don't have connected to my phone or anything. That one's okay. even easier. <laughs> so as soon as they're done doing it, you just walk over and, and read yep. the yep, reading? Yeah, it'll show right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you, you also do, um, you check, you can check their imbalances. Yeah. So this will be, a, I'm keeping an eye out when I'm doing their assessments for any sort of telltales they'll have, which I'll try to save later on in the training assessment, not in the assessment, I'll try to save later on in the training program, because during the assessment I'm literally just assessing their athletic ability without me interrupting them at all. And when I see one thing, one exercise that will do that will really tell me any imbalances they have is something I like to call hip band walks. Um, you guys have probably seen them. You'll put a band around your ankles and we'll just kind of weirdly walk forward and backwards and sideways right. and there'll be a really big hip burner and every, pretty much everyone does them. But what I'm really looking for is what Darian said is their imbalances. So every single athlete I've ever had, including myself, everyone has asymmetries in their hips and their feet. Whether these asymmetries are massive or minute is entirely on the athlete and depending on how big of an asymmetry it is is really how much we're going to address it but everyone's going to have one so for example i'm watching uh, they're instructed to keep their toes straight forward this is still working on the hip band walks and i'll say next level is try to keep the weight on the outside of your feet when we're walking and then as they're getting tired i'm going to watch an athlete's either right or left foot slowly rotate and their toes are going to point out one way or they're ankles are slowly going to cave or both mm -hmm. and then it, like I said it's going to be different on each foot and it's very much correlates to how much stability they have in their hip which is something I'm going to address later on in the program um, depending on how big the asymmetry is. Okay mm -hmm. yeah I know because we kind of sped through and we've got through the first part of the assessment. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, when somebody comes in, do they do you, do they go through like a warm up? Do you still warm them up and? Yeah, so I have to get them ready for for the assessment because our assessment is actually one of the harder things you'll do with us because I'm not really big on just beating you up and tying you down. I want to see how you can perform when you're fresh because if you can perform, if you give me your 100% of your 100%, that's going to make you better. If you give me 100% when you're at 80%, that's not enough. Uh, so I will make sure that you're warmed up to make sure you're healthy and ready for the assessment because like I said, that's probably going to be really one of the more tiring things you do with us. And the assessment, that's just one time. Mm -hmm. Yep, so and we'll run through a normal athletic assessment for our, our very first session that you have with me, and that'll run for an hour. Okay, and you can get all that you need to know in order for the second one. Yep, so the, the number two session, what I like to do is an RPR assessment. And then with the R, what RPR stands for is Reflexive Performance Reset. And it is something that myself and one of the owners, Clint Cox of TAD Sports, is certified in. There's different levels. We're certified in level one and level two. So we've had a decent amount of education in this and even more um, implementing it with our athletes. And we've noticed some massive changes when we implement this. And they're very, very effective. Mm -hmm. And so I like to do it with just about every single athlete I have. But the number two thing is, like I said, with that RPR assessment. And what I'll do is I'll bring the athlete into one of our back rooms and they're set up on a massage table pretty much because you can kind of think of RPR as a, a muscular stimulation thing, but it's like through the nervous system. And how and I'll be pretty much look like massaging them, but it's not that comfortable <laughs> when, when we're doing it. But it is very effective and worth it. And so give an example yeah. as to, you know, what, what you're looking for and like can you Describe what that would be for somebody, like give an example. Yeah, so I'll bring someone in. The first thing I'll do is I'll have them lie down on our massage table. They'll be lying face down. I'll take one of their heels and we'll put them close to their butt. And when we're doing that, we're trying to relax the hamstring to keep the hamstring out of it. I'll lift their knee up and I'll tell them just to hold me. And I'll say, hold as hard as you possibly can. It doesn't matter if, and I've noticed, it doesn't matter if it's a 500-pound squatter who's a collegiate defensive lineman, massive guy, or if it's a 14-year-old soccer girl who's been in the weight room three times in her life. Mm -hmm. I can push them down pretty easily. And the reason for that is because they're really not functioning how they're supposed to be functioning. So an example of that is, like I said, I'll have that knee up. I'll push them down. Two things are going to happen. One, they're going to drop straight down. Um, if they drop straight down, I know they're relying on their hamstring. I know it's because I put their heel on their butt and that mitigates their hamstring. It makes it relaxed so it cannot contract. Um, the next thing that could potentially happen is they'll rotate. And if they rotate, I know they're relying on their back because their back is stabilizing their hips, their pelvis. And if I push them down without me stabilizing them, they're just going to rotate on that table. Mm -hmm. So they're either going to be a back or a hamstring person. And then with that knowledge, I can try to knock that out and then try to make them a glute fire. And then if you're firing with the glute, you're going to be much more athletic and much safer. It's going to be the number one thing also. And you're, be, you're going to become more balanced. Yes, yes, because you're not going to be firing with those compensation patterns anymore, mm -hmm. as in hamstring or back. Well, and then that's mm -hmm. how overuse and injuries can occur too because yes. you're overworking the same muscles over and over again. Um, and some of the drills, mm -hmm. did we talk about all of the drills for, you know, something just as such as that? So, so one thing that Darian touched on was um, the imbalances just there. One thing that I really prioritize in our programs are barbell reverse lunges. Um, I will lead an athlete into it. I mean, I'm not going to put a barbell on an athlete's back that's not ready for it. So, for example, once they can look pretty proficient with kettlebells and they can look stable and everything, we got to get them on the barbell because the barbell is going to be a lot more effective. But now the barbell on their back, and to make it slightly more challenging and more stability oriented, as a, and it's actually keep it a little bit safer, we'll make them finish with a really high hip and a high ankle, so they're pretty much on one leg, and then they'll lunge right into it, and then back to that high hip and high ankle and lunge. And if they can show me proficient balance and stability on that, then we get to add weight. But another thing we have is a device called a push, and it measures the bar's velocity when it's going up. So how fast can they drive that bar up? The faster you can lift it, typically the better athlete, and the more weight um, I can put on the bar. So you're talking about a bench press, though? 
This can be any exercise now. This any. little, yeah, this little um, device will strap on the barbell. So still with the reverse lunge, so they'll lunge and then come up, and the device will give me a number. And we're going back to the asymmetries now. Usually with the left leg or the right leg, you're gonna have different uh, numbers. Okay. Yeah, and then that's how, and I will definitely have to address that. Okay. We're going to take a quick break and then you're going to finish up and tell us even more stuff when we come back. Dagger Law has been part of the Lancaster community for more than 110 years. This is where we live and work. You'll see us at festivals, sporting events, and all around town. We consider our clients as friends and we walk alongside you through challenging times. Whether you're a growing business, a changing family, facing litigation, planning your future, or dealing with land issues, we're right here. We are local. We are trusted. We are experienced. Dagger Law. Hey guys, we're back. This is Healthy Life Designing, and we are here with our guest, Hunter Winans. He is the manager and head trainer over at TAD Sports, and we're finishing up talking about sports performance. And we left off talking about the reverse lunge and the, and the push-ups. Can you talk a little bit more about those? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start off with the barbell reverse lunge mm -hmm. because that's absolutely what I prioritize in our training programs. Um, a lot, I've, I mean, when I grew up and I went to a trainer, they were prioritized like squats and everything like that. And that's obviously really common for a reason. Um, we used to do that. We kind of switched over to the barbell reverse lunge, number one, because we saw a little bit more translation into sport. Number two is because I really started seeing the asymmetries in all of our athletes, which mm. we've mentioned a handful of times. So what I mentioned earlier is we have a push device, and that push device measures the speed of the barbell when it's coming up. So for example, if my, my left hip is my unstable hip, my bad hip, versus my right one is my little bit more good, my better one for sure. And so for example, if I do a reverse lunge, it doesn't matter what the, speed, what the weight is. It could be an empty bar, it could be 135, it could be a lot more. And my left hip is always slower. So when I'm doing my left leg, I'll, I'll step back my right leg, lunge it up with my left leg, I'll get a speed, and I'll do my sets and my reps with that one, with that leg. And then I'll do my right leg, same exact thing. I'm trying as hard as I possibly can. And no matter how hard I try, it's going to be a little right. bit faster on the right than it is on the left. Yeah. So that's that asymmetry that I'm talking about that I'm really trying to target with the reverse lunges. But if, say, we were to use squats as our number one thing, it would come. It would never target that because you're hitting right. both, both joints both at the exact same time. Exactly. Yeah. So you'll, you'll have that favor. You'll, have, you'll use your favorite hip always and you'll never you'll never even know you might not you may never even know that you have an asymmetry which the reverse lunges can fix and can really show if you have a weakness there and that device mm -hmm. that's the one that you had showed me when i had came to the facility yes. the one day and that one does connect to an app on your phone yes yeah that one will read on my phone yes and i'll, I'll commonly put it right in front of the athlete so they can see it and what's kind of cool about that is they'll give them a little bit of intent and a little bit of competition I mean, because they're, they're an athlete for a reason, they like competition. Yes. So uh, for example, with myself, I'll do that lunge and say the device might read 0 0.60 meters per second. Okay, I gotta get a little bit faster. It's like this weight's not heavy enough, I gotta get a little bit faster. Uh -huh. And it drives a little bit of internal competition within myself and with the athletes that we've been using. So that's another really cool thing about that device that we have is it drives internal competition and if, even if in your group setting it's even a little bit better because you what comes to mind right now is a softball group i have with these two pretty talented girls um they're a little bit different but they compete the absolute mm -hmm. same like one of them's a little bit better at sprinting one of them's a little bit better at lifting but we have those electronic devices where there's not going to be any air so it's not like i'm favoring one of them right or, or the other and they're just going to compete with each other and that Competition breeds success. Right. Well, and mm -hmm. it, it helps create relationships too. I think, and I think oh, that's absolutely. a huge thing that gets left out with with sports in itself. You know, the focus of sports, a lot of it is team building too. But there's the push-ups. Mm -hmm. So is that measured the same way? 
So we do. We have attached that device on their arms for push-ups, and you can do the same thing. You can test the velocity when you do that. Um, and we also on the jump mat, which I don't think I ever told you. You can you can do push-ups on the jump mat and make it a plyo push-up, and you get off in the air and it'll read like if you're eight or nine inches off the ground. Really? And yeah. So that that's another again another competitive thing you, you can do, and in the group setting. Breeds competition, competition breeds results, mm -hmm. and then also even in the assessment, I've done it a handful of times. Uh, when I have more time, I'll, I'll I'd like to implement those things like that. But I like to stick with my standards. Mm -hmm. But for example, like uh, a group of football players, they might really like that one. People oh, that, are, yeah. that are pretty decent at push-ups, mm -hmm. they'll want to get up and see how high they can get up off what their vertical is with their upper body, right? So to speak. Exactly, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so how are you able to, so I, I like using the barbell and the ver reverse lunge mm -hmm. and to see the imbalances. How are you able to do that with the push-up? I don't. You don't. <laughs> no. So you're just able to measure just the velocity, yes. just their power with the push-up and yes. that's it. That was going to be straight power. Yeah, we can't see any imbalances in that one. No. So one of, um, one of the people that I love in this industry, his name is uh, Cal Dietz. He's currently the strength coach at the University of Minnesota. And he came up with, he labeled as triphasic training. And then luckily I, I kind of fell into it right before, um, right before graduating Dennis and before I worked at TAD Sports. And the owner of TAD Sports actually learned about it and was implementing it a couple years before I did. So it was kind of cool that I knew about it when I went in to go talk to him originally. But yeah. But that's a system that we use and it's been very successful with us and we've been sticking to it for a reason. And what it essentially is, is it's breaking down every muscle action and training it in, diff in uh, individual phases. So what, so what you can picture is a vertical jump. The athlete's gonna dip down, they're gonna pause for like half a second. They're not gonna try to pause, but you can't change direction without pausing. Okay? So they're gonna dip down, They'll have that half a second pause, mm -hmm. and then they'll jump up. So those are those three different phases, the drop, the stop, and the produce. So I like to say it's absorb and produce. So the very first section is them absorbing. They're dipping down. They have to absorb force. So that is called an eccentric mm -hmm. muscle contraction. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have an entire phase where we really focus on eccentric muscle contractions. And the whole goal there is what I said earlier is absorbing force. So if an athlete can absorb force, they can then produce force. You're really not going to be able to produce that much force if you can't absorb it. It's kind of like in cars with brakes. Like you're not going to have a Lamborghini with bad brakes. You brakes. can't stop and go. Yeah. Yeah, it's just not going to work. Right. Or you're going to get hurt. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the eccentric phase makes the athlete way more efficient at absorbing forces. And then the theory there is that they're going to, after that, they're going to be more efficient at producing forces. And so far, we've been seeing that. And also with the eccentric phase, like in that absorption that we're talking about, they can now abs absorb forces and they can, they're going to be more resilient to injuries. And so uh, a force isn't going to be too much for them and their tissue is going to break. That's, that's not going to happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Ideally, is after that eccentric phase, they'll be able to absorb those forces and it's no longer going to hurt them as it would in the past. The next phase, that little millisecond stop in the jumps where you go absorb, stop, and then come up the jump, that's called an isometric. And so that's complete absorption now. So when we're doing our training, we're trying to get our more proficient athletes to drop down as fast as they can. They're going to hold the weight there for an allotted amount of time, and then they're going to move it up as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. So at that point, they've already gone through the absorption phase. We want to see them absorb it now with velocity, which right. is going to be a lot harder exactly. than doing it really slow and stopping. Exactly. It. It's going to be a lot harder. Now yeah, they have the yeah. power. Yeah. If you, if you add speed to something, it makes it a lot harder to mm -hmm. do. And it's going to be a little bit more of a training effect, too. So after, after a couple weeks of that, and they get through what's called that isometric phase, now in my head and in the triphasic training, they are fully capable of absorbing forces. At first they were working on absorbing it, now they can completely absorb it, now it's time to produce it. So in, in the past, if you think of any sort of weight training, you just go and you just lift your reps, you just lift it, and that's it. There's, there's no focus on the downward, there's no focus on the stop, mm -hmm. it's only what can I lift Yes, up. yes. Yeah. So we were focusing first on the absorb, total absorption, and then producing. Okay, so once we got through the eccentric and the isometric phase, 
then you get to what is more of the notorious weightlifting is just is just repping and seeing what I can produce now. Mm -hmm. And then you will typically find that you can produce a lot more force than you previously could after you've learned how to absorb force a little bit more efficiently. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's another thing uh, that I, I wanted you to, to talk about for a few minutes here we have left. The, what is it, the Hypervolt gun. Yes. Can you talk about that? That thing is pretty much addicting at this point. I have brought it out for every single one of my personal clients and they re pretty much refuse to warm up without it at this point. Okay. Yeah, it is, it is actually incredible. So it's pretty much a massage gun with a vibrating head and there's different heads that you can use on it. And it is incredible. So number one, athletes just kind of use it and just poke around on whatever muscles they want to hit and that'll make them feel really good. What I like to use it for is what we talked about earlier is RPR. And in the, in the past, I, I mean, it's just um, manual manipulation. So mm -hmm. I'll use like my thumbs, my fingers. The athletes can do their own. They can do it by themselves with their thumbs and their fingers. Very effective. I still saw a ton of results. Um, but I actually had a couple of defensive linemen at Denison come in. These guys are huge. These guys are like 300 yeah. pounds. Yeah. And they would borderline break my thumbs when I was doing it. Oh. And it, it got pretty brutal. Um, but anyway, we we recently got the Hypervolt gun, and I, I had this thought, I was like, we can implement it in the RPR stuff, see what happens. And so I started doing it on myself at first, and I, it was incredible. Because a couple, cause a, a couple spots with RPR, I can't really get enough leverage on myself to mm -hmm. do it on myself. And so I was using the gun and the, the, vibrating, the vibrations, for whatever reason, it made it 10 times more effective, and it was as if like someone else did it to me. And, I was good to go. So after doing that, I was just like, okay, let me try it on some of the more proficient athletes. Yeah. They had the exact same results and we really haven't looked back. Oh my and, gosh. And like I said, it is at this point, it's addicting. Everyone refuses to really work out without it. Right, point. well, you can use it before your workout, after your workout, you have Darn. all of that lactic yeah. acid build up. Mm -hmm. And oh, wow, that's great. Yeah. I know foam rolling is a go-to for myself, but fully automated timing system. That's what we used in our assessment and throughout our training. Um, this is another device that we really can't function with that at this point. So in our assessment, like I said, we'll do the, an acceleration test to do the 20 yard dash where I can, I can really break down the 20 yard dash into whatever components I want. It just depends on how far apart I set the cones, but it's always 10 and 10 and I've just gotten some information out of that. And the cool thing is is that it, it's not going to lie to you. You can't cheat it. There's no human mm -hmm. error at all. And then we'll also do a flying 10 meter. And in the track world, which is really the speed world, um, the flying 10 meter is one of the best like tests you can do. And you can really tell who's the best athlete on the team is via the flying 10 meter. And I, I think it's pretty incapable to do that test without a fully automated timing um, system. So for example, our track we have at TAD is 65 to 70 yards long, so we have enough room to perform a flying 10 meter. And if you don't have 50 plus yards of space, you really, you really can't do that test. But I'll set up a cone at roughly our 40 yard mark and then the other one at 10 meters farther than that. I'll have an athlete build up into it. So I'll tell them you gotta start in a jog, build up mm -hmm. a run, mm -hmm. build up into a full speed sprint yeah. before that first cone. And so with that cone, it has that infrared laser and the athletes are wearing the chip. Their time's gonna start right when that chip crosses that infrared laser and it's gonna finish 10 right. years later when it's an infrared laser. And that information is crucial that I can get their full, their full speed time at 10 meters. Because like every other timing is, is acceleration is incorporated. If I just get a stopwatch out and get someone's 40 yard dash, you'll be able to tell who the fastest athlete is, but you won't be able to tell how efficient they are at top end speed. Well, and it, it gets that light switch going again with the competitive, competitive nature that these yes. people have, the athletes have anyways. But um, we're out of time. So if you could share with the folks uh, in the information about the website, where to find you guys and how to get in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, Darian said, we were located in Granville and we actually re just redid our website fairly recently. So. I think it looks a lot better now, and it's a little bit easier to use, and there's a lot more information on it too. But you can find that at tadsports.com, 
We are also fairly active on Instagram. At our handle will be at TAD Sports. It's all lowercase. That's exactly how it sounds. And we also have a Facebook page that is also at TAD Sports. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for making the trip down here to chat with us today. Really appreciate it. No, thank you, Darren. Pleasure's all mine. And that's all we have today. And you're watching Healthy Life Designing. We will see you soon.